Thanks very much. Uh, this leads on beautifully, uh, looking at forage systems for targeted deer production. And the clear message here is you give us a target and we can have that discussion about how to fix that with a forage. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Alistair Moorhead. I'm the, uh, a senior agronomist for Agricom and a product development specialist in that group. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of Glenn Judson who puts in an apology, he can't, uh, couldn't be here today, and Dr Glenn Judson's uh, deer production specialist. The irony of this discussion with that component as well is that we were classmates at uni. We both did undergrad studies in copper uh, and copper supplementation in the early 90s, which uh, obviously got Glenn uh, caught on the deer. He carried on to do a PhD in uh, deer production systems. And this is where it gets really interesting because there's a lot of Groundhog Day going on here. And the acknowledgement is we, we can't actually ever stop. We have to keep talking about these discussions and we have to keep sharing because as we age, just as the comment from the back highlights, uh, not a lot actually changes. It's just that no one new has actually experienced it firsthand. So in the early 2000s, uh, the mid 90s actually, Deer, uh, Glenn took on the job of uh, writing the Deer Master Manual. And of course, what happens when you get to the forage section? You pick up the phone, talk to a trusted advisor, and me being his mate and an agronomist at the time, that's exactly how the process started in that, uh, in that document. And so it doesn't really differ a lot from what we're doing here today. My introduction here is looking at the production cycles of supply and demand. It's very, very basic, and that's why we're going to rush through this and maybe possibly save some time. Uh, we're going to look at forages in the deer context, looking at the different species, and then look at forage rotations, because it's in this place that I think it's actually the most interesting part of the discussion about where we might get some gain in this topic. Looking at the supply and demand curve, it is, it is quite obvious that this varies based on rainfall zone, irrigation availability and, and landscape. So it is not a generic topic. But there is some classical demand requirements of the deer and the different categories of deer. And our forages are very, very influenced by your region and your growth potential from your own examples. When we're looking at demand, Obviously stocking rate has a big part to play in this. It doesn't matter what forage you put on your farm. If you don't get your stocking rate right, they won't grow. So stocking rates of hinds, young stock, cattle, sheep ratios are all big influences on animal production. Another part that was just highlighted in Jason's presentation, your expectations of growth and performance have another major part to play in the role of demand and the forage demand requirement. And timing of events has a big influence as well. Weaning, stock sales, winter feeding, spring flushing policies. All these are discussions that help form your targets of which we may be able to have that discussion around forage fits. When you look at supply, it's stuff you're already doing now. Many of you have utilised the species we're talking about, maybe not in some of the ways we're doing today, but you've used them, they're not new. There's very little new on this list up here, apart from possibly the introduction or reintroduction of fodder beet into the feed systems. But we're looking at the role of just new pastures and, and species choice. And some of the advanced parties highlighted that in our session just prior. Uh, the way we're using some of these species has changed greatly. I mean, plantain didn't exist as a forage herb when, we start, when I left university. And today we're discussing it as a part of a pasture and or a species out by itself. It's a big, big change in that system. Uh, red clover, another topic. I'm wearing it on my shirt today because it's really very significant and it has a great place in the system. But these are species you know about, but we may not, may be using them in a different way today. The impacts on conservation, change of pasture covers, grazing management, winter rotation length. We've talked about the spates can already. There's some pretty significant uh, thought processes going in this and another 20 years worth of research since we last did these discussions in, in the mid-90s and early 2000s. So there's a lot of knowledge that we can put into these places right now. We are focusing on the production cycle and this is the acknowledgement of timings where, fo um, where foragers may have their roles. 
You're looking at key periods for early lactation, late lactation from pretty much set stocking in late October, November, right through to March. And for rising one-year-olds, it's a very big story of the lactation phase, setting them up for the 1st of June. Uh, what you do in winter is dependent on your expectations, and then again, we just can't limit these animals in spring if you're going on a fast finishing cycle. All these things we need to acknowledge if we're going to put a forage system in place for you, of which, again, you're probably already doing. We're just trying to package it. So when you look at the different species we have available to us today, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty strong list that we've got up there. They've got all their strengths, and for different stock classes, uh, particularly when we focus on weaning, uh, fawning and weaning, you can see some classical advantages of certain types of species. Uh, fodder beets, Italian ryegrasses have got positives and limitations. Uh, the plantain, again, it's got positive and weaknesses where it may not be any better than anything else. And I think actually the advanced party data very clearly showed that. If you looked at that information, probably the biggest takeaway point was the uniformity of performance throughout the 12 months. It was not necessarily spectacular all the way through, but it was be very, very uniform, which helps planning. The red clover, very interesting from this industry's perspective. Lucerne, likewise, landscape use, the areas that you're working in today, the areas where deer are now and uh, where they may be in the future, Lucerne will play a very strong and important part. Does it fit? For big parts of the system, it can. Uh, fescues and grasses, the key to these things is that they are grasses. Many of these things are what you're doing now. It's taking advantage of them for short periods of time and realising you have got a stock class that is actually quite hard to manage through lactation phase with a grass-based system. Really, really hard to deal with seed head. And brassicas. They sit there both for a winter tool, but also as a summer tool in many cases. And again, the irony of all of this, and I'll put my own little bit of experience on this, it was just fascinating how powerful the hind was for, for lactating off her own back. Regardless of pasture quality, uh, the fawn took all the energy from the mum and all the work we did in the, in the um, 90s and early 2000s. The key to that, though, was if we could wean, the fawn weights were typically uniform. If we could wean, though, the, the hind heavy, that had quite big ramifications for cycling going forward. But if you bring her off a poor quality grass pasture and low body condition, you know, there's big implications for that over time, particularly if you had other issues such as minerals and or animal health on top of that. So this is just an example of what we're highlighting where grass is grass. It doesn't matter what variety of grass it is, it really doesn't. Grass is grass. It breaks down in the rumen in a very, very similar way and it has one characteristic that's really hard to manage and that is by the time you start set stocking, it's ready to go to seed and you've been dealing with that virtually the whole time you've been deer farming or interacting with this animal class. And it is well worthwhile understanding that there are different types out there and for different landscapes and fawning patterns there may be some serious advantages associated with understanding the roles of different flowering dates on your um, fawning blocks. And looking at an output from this uh, feed theme, really it's the forage systems and rotation planner that will come into play here. It's going to mean different things to different people but there is actually, once you start asking yourselves the right questions, giving us the right targets, there's actually only a few rotations that truly, or forage systems that truly fit your particular needs and demands. So again, identifying those targets, identifying the times that you're really trying to drive a system and or make it cost effective are very, very, very important parts of this forage system planner. I think the end outcome of this is to highlight it is actually not that complicated. It is to set up some expectations about longevity and performance, and it's realising actually in a rotation, not just one forage system but a rotation, there's a natural start point and a natural finish point. And many times when you're debating the timing of having another graze, will it last another year, there's actually quite a lot of economics tied up into the decision of your next part of your rotation and performing with that. So when I watch this being developed by the group, one of the things I take from it is it is going to simplify a system that you're already running. 
It's going to create a few regimented timings and thought processes, and if you stick to those types of scenarios, it takes a lot of confusion out of this style of forage development. So in a summary, we're matching supply to demand with targeted forages and forage rotations, and always with the aim of increasing the kgs of product while increasing the profit per kg of product.